Together, come out of this room, this board here.
Good morning. Um, it's great to be back in Northeast Florida. I'm happy to be joined here by, by our First Lady, um, who uh, has a lot on her plate with, uh, with, with three young kids uh, uh, running around the house. And then... Um, who don't sleep. No, they don't. Uh, we also have the uh, Mary Mayhew is our ACA secretary doing a great job. Richard Prudhomme, Secretary of Elder Affairs, doing a great job. Uh, Michelle Bannum from the Alzheimer's Association, and then a special guest, Mary Daniel. So we appreciate uh, your story, and we look forward uh, to uh, letting everybody hear more about it. Uh, the goal of this roundtable is to discuss to continue uh, how we can continue protecting our most vulnerable uh, citizens, uh, those in long-term care facilities, uh, but also uh, recognizing how difficult uh, these last four and a half months have been for, for many, many families uh, throughout the state of Florida. When uh, the coronavirus uh, started rearing its head throughout other parts of the world, it was pretty apparent that it had a disproportionate effect uh, on those who were elderly. And uh, it was also apparent that if you looked at elderly living on their own in society versus long-term care who needed some type of assisted living, um, it hit even harder on those uh, who had comorbidities and who needed uh, assistance uh, with living. And so uh, we also understood, I think, pretty early on that this was a virus that really thrived in close contact, congregate indoor settings, which obviously a lot of our nursing and long-term care facilities fit that bill perfectly. And so uh, we knew that that was a source of vulnerability um, in the state of Florida. And so the beginning or the middle of uh, March, uh, we took the step of suspending uh, visitation into these facilities because we feared that the virus could be brought in and infect people and spread and, and create um, obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of risks uh, to mortality and morbidity for the residents. Uh, we also prohibited individuals uh, from, we prohibited hospitals from discharging COVID positive residents back to nursing homes uh, if they had not cleared the illness. And um, I think that was something that, that was really critical in, um, in, in limiting uh, the spread. Uh, we also required facilities to implement strict screening protocols for all staff and all contractors. Uh, we required all staff to wear PPE, uh, such as masks and gloves and, and face shields, but we didn't just tell them to do it. We put our money where our mouth is. The state of Florida sent uh, to just to long-term care facilities more than 10 million masks, more than 1 million gloves, more than half a million face shields and more than 900,000 gowns. And we were sending the PPE at a time when the hospitals were still trying to get a lot of PPE. And we were helping them too. The market was very tight. Uh, but, but my instinct was, look, if we can protect 
these long-term care facilities and limit infections there, the hospitals will need less PPE because these are the people that are going to be most likely to be hospitalized if they get infection. And so we thought that that was kind of getting ahead of it, doing that, and I think that um, you know that has helped limit uh, uh, some of the spread. We've also de we also deployed over a period of two months uh, 50 teams of National Guardsmen to test all uh, residents of long-term care facilities throughout the state, uh, all staff, and that's uh, over 4,000 facilities. We also have a mobile testing lab that has also been dispatched to nursing homes uh, to offer tests for residents and for staffs. Uh, we've sent incident management teams to every single nursing home and assisted living facility to check in on infection control practices like screening procedures, sanitation, and wearing PPE appropriately. Uh, and those teams are currently on the, their second round of visits, uh, which they will complete by the end of this week. Uh, we also required hospitals to test all individuals that were being discharged to a long-term care facility, um, even if they were uh, asymptomatic. At that time, we just we weren't sure whether there was spread um, inside the hospital, and we didn't want to send an asymptomatic senior back uh, to a nursing facility uh, who, who could then potentially uh, infect other folks. Uh, we're also now providing biweekly testing for all nursing home and long-term care facility staff. So this is over 200,000 staff members. Uh, they have a self-swab. We have a contract with a private lab who turns the results around in pretty good time. So that is ongoing. So there have probably been close to 300, uh, between three and 350,000 tests done just in the last month uh, with staff in long-term care facilities, and that's something we're going to continue to monitor. The positivity rate amongst the staff has been lower than the state as a whole, but nevertheless, even at a 2, 3, or 4 percent positivity rate, you know, you're looking at a 200,000 people. You know, those are thousands of staff members uh, who've tested positive, um, and so that's something that we're trying to identify and isolate as best we can. And then thanks to uh, the leadership of Mary Mayhew, uh, we uh, have created over the period of the last few months uh, 23 COVID-only nursing facilities uh, that have over 1,500 beds. And these are facilities that can be used uh, to transfer a COVID-positive resident uh, out of a nursing home to a place where they can be uh, pro properly isolated. Uh, they could also be discharged from the hospital to a COVID-only facility, even if they're still COVID positive, because the facility is set up to deal with that, and you don't run the risk of putting them uh, in a regular nursing home and spreading it amongst the seniors. Here in Jacksonville, the Dolphin Point facility uh, has 146 beds. They have 121 uh, residents uh, who, who are currently being cared for there. So those are uh, a lot of steps. Uh, those are steps that have been important uh, in saving lives. Uh, at the same time, you know, those measures have come at a cost. Uh, you have residents of long-term care facilities that have other health problems. And we've had residents of long-term care facilities that have passed away for things other than coronavirus. Of course, this is, uh, this is kind of part, of, part of life. Uh, but throughout the last four and a half months, you know, they have not had the ability to have family members uh, visiting them. They've not had the type of human contact uh, which really, really makes a difference to people uh, who are in those conditions. And obviously, it makes a, it makes a major difference for the caregivers and for, for the family members. And so uh, that human cost, the emotional cost of having these measures in place to try to limit the spread of COVID, uh, those costs are, are profound, and when we went through it, you know, we knew that it was going to be something that, that was significant. Um, as we got into the end of April, all through May and the beginning of June, where the prevalence was very low in the state of Florida, we were, with uh, Secretary Mayhew, working on trying to figure out a pathway, you know, to get the families access again. Uh, that was being worked on, and of course, as we started to get into the third week of June, we started to see indicators increase in prevalence, and of course, um, you know, we've seen prevalence uh, increase. You know, we think we're uh, heading in a um, much better direction in terms of the trends uh, over the last um, uh, week or two, but nevertheless, increased prevalence, put, up, put kind of those plans aside, because we wanted to make sure we were doing all our can to monitor the staff, obviously work on protecting the residents and the general community, um, but I think that 
uh, four and a half months is a long, long time. And uh, we've just got to look at this and say, is there anything we can do right now? Is there things we can do if certain indicators are met in a week or two weeks or a month? And I think a lot of the family members understand that these are difficult circumstances. Uh, I, clearly, they would not want uh, policies to be done that would lead to massive amounts of people in these facilities getting infected. Um, but I think that if you have a, 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 a way forward, uh, I think that would put a lot of people at ease knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, one of the things when we were talking about before we came out, I talked with Mary and uh, both Marys, Mayhew and, and, and Mary Daniel, about, okay, you know, what do we know now? What could we definitely do right now? One of the things I think we can do is any family member who has COVID antibodies should be allowed to go visit the facilities. I mean, if you test positive for that, you know, we know that that confers uh, a certain uh, level of immunity. Most people think about six months at a minimum. Uh, we have not had anyone be reinfected, of course, anywhere in the world thus far. I would be comfortable saying, uh, you know, if you do have those, those uh, COVID-19 antibodies, you know, that you should be able to go in um, and, and, and see your family member. Uh, so we may work on that and may get moving on that. Then there's other things uh, that, that we can look at doing in, in, the, uh, in the short term, I've asked. Mary Daniel, to work with Mary Mayhew and all our guests here, form a committee, solicit feedback from families, uh, propose some steps forward that we can take as a state, and, um, and, and then let's see, let's look at that. Now, other states have tried some things. Some of it hasn't been terribly successful. So you learn from that and you figure out, and not even that it was causing more disease. I just think it was, it was inadequate for what the families really were looking for. Um, and so you know, we want to make sure what we're doing is something that's really, really meaningful. But um, you know, if you think about over the last four and a half months, you have a, an illness that's obviously a contagious. There's a, an effort to, to limit the spread, of course. So you have people who end up in the hospital and for months, uh, they were not allowed to have family members uh, come and visit them. Even in their dying days, they were not allowed uh, to be able to do that. And I've had people come tell me, say, you know, we, you know, my my father was old or my mother was old, had health problems. You know, we understood this is, but to not be there uh, and be able to be there is something that really, really uh, it leaves a mark. And so, uh, I, I want to thank some of the hospitals who have um, allowed visitors uh, to come in in those end-of-life situations because uh, that is, I think, something that people will carry with them for a lifetime. Um, we obviously looking at long-term care facilities and understanding you know, there are people that pass away in those facilities having nothing to do with coronavirus, yet they still didn't have their families to be able to be there as well. So it's not just people you know, with coronavirus we're talking about. This has a broad impact on we have uh, 150,000 residents or s somewhere in that ballpark. Obviously, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of family members uh, throughout the state of Florida. So uh, we've got to figure out a way to not only protect folks from the virus, but also address some of the, the, the serious emotional um, damage that has been done by our countermeasures to the virus. And so that's why we're here today. Uh, I want to introduce the First Lady to, to make some comments, and then we'll hear from Mary, and we'll hear from the rest of our guests. I don't think I honestly could say it any better. Um, Mary, you were on the tip of our tongue this morning when the governor and I were getting ready to leave because we're surrounded by our three kids uh, who are wreaking havoc on the mansion as we speak. Okay, so we're trying to protect Florida's irreplaceable history every day. We've got a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a four-month-old who, by the way, is not fully sleeping through the night. But we have our family next to us. We, we do. And um, you serve as an inspiration to so many people across this state because you found a way. You found a way in uncertain times to have some certainty. You were able to um, realize that these are precious moments that you can share with your husband because you say he recognizes you, you still mm -hmm. and you want to hang on to that as much as possible. So to be with him is so important. While these policies we know save lives, we know that we have to protect the vulnerable and those with underlying conditions because they're the most susceptible to this disease. Um, and so doing this from the onset was important because it did save lives. Now, as you know, for me, something that's very passionate and near and dear to my heart is mental health. 
and you and I have talked on the phone and talked in person about the ramifications and implications of what that means to be away from your loved ones. There are studies that talk about the importance of physical touch and what that does to depression and anxiety, to have somebody there in that capacity. And so I'm so encouraged by just sitting there and listening beforehand, before we came out there. There were ideas being thrown around that you have somebody who found a way. And for those who don't know the story of Mary, uh, it's really exquisite when these policies came down that we need to protect our vulnerable and we need to protect those with underlying conditions. She found a way, and that really is truly the American spirit that we will find a way to overcome. We will not let this define us. And so you got a job as a dishwasher to be able to be in the facility, to be able to be with your loved one. Now we need to make sure that other people can be with their loved ones too. And so um, for you to be a part of this now task force, to be able to chart a course forward. Uh, again, we're not going to let it define us. Uh, the governor said that so many times, that we're going to be able to be bigger and better and stronger. We just have to find that way. Um, so thank you for being here today. Thank you for everything that you have done, and thank you for your, for your understanding that in uncertain times we will find that certainty as we look at the science and we move forward. Um, you are an inspiration, and, and, and God bless you for everything that you're doing. So it's a, a pleasure to, to introduce Mary Daniel to speak a little so bit more on this. Thank you. I am honored to be here. This is, uh, I've been asking for this day f uh, since the first email I sent you back in March. So um, this has been a lot of work and culmination, and I am thrilled to be with both of you and, and this group of people because these are the people that can come up with ideas and can make uh, the, I, I sit here representing hundreds of thousands of caregivers. It's not just me. I represent all of them and we are desperate and we are lonely and we are hopeless and helpless. And I get to represent us with this great team of people here. And um, I am absolutely confident that we will come up with ideas to get us step by step this is not a fast, uh, un unfortunately, we, and we don't want to open the doors. We don't want to be foolish. We don't want to make mistakes here. It's incredibly important that we do it right. But I am truly confident that we are going to be able to get, um, get ideas and put them in, into implementation for, for the state of Florida. That will be copied, by the way, um, all across the United States. We have an opportunity to put out a roadmap. Um, our Facebook page is, uh, has, a, has a chapter in every single state. They are watching us today and they're watching what we're doing. And I'm thrilled to not, even, not only be able to do it for the state of Florida, but to really show the United States how we can make these uh, loved ones feel loved um, and nurtured and held and hugged again. So I appreciate the opportunity very much. Great. Uh, Mary Mayhew. Well, I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be here and, and have had the chance to sit and talk um, with Mary. Um, Mary's situation and, and the desire to be with your husband, um, and as you say, there are thousands and thousands of families here in Florida, and I certainly have heard from many, and the governor and, no, and the first lady have heard from so many, and as we've said all along, you know, there isn't a day that goes by that my heart does not break. Uh, because of this policy. We, we today have an opportunity to provide hope, to provide a pathway to support the very connection that we constantly advocate for. We want people being uh, connected to their loved ones. When we think about what matters when you're in a residential uh, facility, when you're in a nursing home, when you're in an assisted living facility, it's that human interaction. It's the opportunity to be with family. But we also knew that the population most at risk from this deadly virus are our elderly, that the setting, that a residential setting, a, a nursing home, an assisted living facility was most vulnerable to rapid transmission. And we, the governor led, we were determined to stand guard at the door uh, to protect our most vulnerable. Every single day we've learned something new about this virus, which also made it difficult to know every single policy change that needed to occur to protect. I'm proud um, of the work that we have done to 
protect our elderly. When you think about the percentage in Florida, uh, we have 4.5 million individuals over the age of 65 in our state. We have 154,000 individuals that live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, over 200,000 staff. Every day, uh, we have talked about and thought about across all of our agencies uh, with the governor, all of the various protections through since over five months to, to protect our most vulnerable, our elderly individuals with underlying medical conditions. But we've also known about the, the consequences of the lack of, of human interaction, of family members not being able uh, to have that daily connection. You know, we've seen a lot in five months. We have an opportunity to create a framework to do this safely with leadership and, and engagement from Mary and others uh, who firsthand have seen, have, have uh, seen what the facilities are capable of. And together, I am confident that we can create a, an approach that stands, stays true to our goal of protecting our elderly, but supports what we all know is so critically important. Uh, we, I'm concerned about the mental health, about the physical health, uh, of, of our seniors in our facilities. And so this, this is exactly where we need to be. And we will, with great input, um, Secretary Prudham has done uh, such amazing work with the outreach and the engagement around the state. So we've got a lot of valuable feedback that we can uh, take advantage of to help shape uh, the right framework to safely allow visitation so that Mary and others have the opportunity to be with their loved ones uh, that is so critically important to all of us. So, Governor, thank you. Thank you. Richard Purdom. Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, it's good to be here. Um, as you heard, you know, the uh, COVID-19 does have a disproportionate impact on the older adults and obviously the facilities, as you heard from the Governor, the First Lady and Secretary Mayhew, have been essentially uh, locked down to uh, protect life. Uh, but at the same time, the governor challenged us to sort of look at ways of, uh, of how do we address uh, this, uh, the, the lives of these individuals in these situations. You've heard about the uh, undue impact on mental health, and uh, as first days alleged as well, alluded to as well, it's going to be the new pandemic. So we have been really looking at ways to address the mental health and the social isolation. Uh, of those individuals in uh, in those facilities and one of the things that we uh, looked at first was um, uh, engaging with the Alzheimer's Association on a uh, something called Project Vital which stands for uh, Virtual Inclusive Technology for All and we uh, using um, um, some of the stimulus money from the federal government were able to uh, uh, provide uh, tablets uh, to communities uh, two tablets per community and we've got a total of 300 out there right now 156 communities and what those tablets are, they're actually, I've got one right here, and they're uniquely designed for older adults. You can't just drop a couple of tablets off at a facility and have the older adults mess around on the internet. It's a dangerous place. <laughs> so these tablets are uniquely designed for older adults. They're very sort of intuitive for them to use. It's also a controlled virtual technology environment. So there's resources on here that are very easy for someone to use. A staff member is also trained in how to, to use it. And there's their areas of, of interest you know, ranging from certain things like travel and playing games and relaxation, you know, worship, learning and, and listening and things like that, like music and, uh, and TV shows. They've actually got a real cool one as well, these old commercials from the 50s, which people sort of say, oh yeah, I remember that, and it's sort of, the, it's very intuitive. But also what's really important, and, and, and I imagine Michelle's going to touch on that, is over two-thirds of people living in these facilities have some for, are living with some form of dementia. And so we have resources on these tablets that staff can use to interact better with those residents who are living with dementia. To obviously, they, they're already having uh, issues living with the disease, and this trauma of being isolated is, is adding to that. So there's resources on there that can help these facilities handle that. But in addition to that, what, we, uh, what we're doing is um, uh, we've uh, uh, also purchased about 1,400 animatronic pets and their dogs and cats that actually uh, uh, older adults can identify with. And it's very calming when you sort of hand these, uh, these pets over, which look and feel like a real pet. You actually feel a heartbeat. 
uh, and uh, they meow and they, and they bark. It's kind of a little odd but so when you see them, but when you sort of see someone embrace that and all of a sudden all of that calm and that profound impact on that individual and we're sort of seeing, uh, like I said, 1,400 requests for these uh, coming through and we're getting these great stories of people saying, you know, that uh, someone hasn't talked for about nine weeks, all of a sudden he's going around the facility introducing him to their new pet. Uh, so there's th different ways of doing this. The Alzheimer's Association donated like a thousand MP3 players that, you, we, that we could have, you know, uh, put on with different types of music. You know, I think you stole the 80s disco music, but the rest of the stuff, you know, you can listen to country or, or, or spiritual or gospel or, or anything. And, if, and music, and you speak more than this than I can, about the, the, the value of music to someone that lives living with dementia. So we're really, really excited by the possibility. And I'm going to, talking about the, the, you know, the, a hug is, is so, so important. I have a six-year-old niece that lives in England, and she was concerned that uh, I'm not staying at home. So she sent me a, uh, a virtual hug, <laughs> which is her arms, and uh, she had them cut out. And I thought, that's what we need to send to people, because, I mean, that made me feel good. And uh, so I think that the, the, a little six-year-old came up with this idea and, uh, and stuff. So I think this is something that we can look at to sort of uh, introducing to facilities, because getting this from a six-year-old you know, well, it is awesome. I'm really pleased. So, you know, we're, we're working on a lot of different things. There's a lot of good, you know, single stories, but when you add them up, it makes a huge story, a huge uh, uh, story of people pulling together, looking at the issues, and coming up with ways to address, you know, uh, the, the, the pandemic and the, and the impacts of this. So, you know, it's, 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 it really is, like you said, Mary, it's a pleasure to be here and to listen to someone like Mary. And, and you know, this is just engaged, and, and it makes us want to help even more. It, it gives us the, you know, we, we talk about it being tough and stuff to get up in the morning. It makes you feel good when you know you're helping someone. It's not that tough when you think, hey, I made a difference. And when you get a letter of a 97-year-old lady who uh, uh, they got a birthday cake delivered to her, you know, in the facility, you know, along with her tablet with a big smile on her face because she got a happy birthday sung to her from her daughter on that tablet, that's priceless. You can't, you can't, you know, so that's, it's, it's all worth it. So it, again, it's, thank you for being here. It's really awesome to, uh, and we're going to engage on some good stuff. And yes. like the governor said, we're going to uh, we're going to make a difference. So. Thank you. Thanks so much for all your hard work, Michelle. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to say, Mary, I'm so proud of you. Uh, sometimes it just takes one really beautiful voice to speak up. So I've been following your story for a while. Um, I'm relentlessly optimistic about Florida because I get the privilege of being um, for the Alzheimer's Association. We're global. We're national. So we get to compare notes with other states and how they're handling it. Florida was first out of the gate with social isolation and how to mitigate the impact. I spoke with Secretary Prudhomme in the early um, days of COVID in March, and people couldn't believe how Florida was coming up with some of these creative ideas so early in the process and how we had jumped through the bureaucratic hoops to get to where we needed to be. Now, Project Vital, as Secretary Prudhomme uh, mentioned, is a beautiful project. It doesn't work for everybody in every facility, and we talked with Mary, um, over 60% of those folks that are living with dementia in these facilities. Sometimes that technology doesn't work, but I'm optimistic that if we came up with an idea like Project Vital, there's more. There's more to come up with while we're looking for valid paths of visitation, while Secretary Mayhew is working hard on where we can go next with that. What can we do in the interim and engaging with you, Mary, and families like you to reduce the anxiety and the stress, not just of the person living with the disease, living in the residential facility, but also the families like you and the stress that that has and on the staff. So I know there's so many places we can go and I'm optimistic about where we are right now with isolation and what we're doing to mitigate the impacts of that and where we can go from there. So sitting here talking with you all, um, I think there's a lot of creative ideas to be that we have yet to even um, look through, especially some of the ones that Secretary Prudiman and I have been mentioning lately, um, like virtual hugs from EV. I love that. So um, I, I thank you for being here and for the opportunity to this, obviously for the Alzheimer's Association, this is front of, of mind because our population is there and um, the, the facilities, like I said, over 60% of our folks are, are living in these facilities. And we wanna make sure that they're comfortable, they're happy and they're safe. So how do we do that together? And um, I think Florida is well on the path to doing that. We've already started some really good work and we'll have a forum on August 20th to talk to other states about that and that'll be great. I'll get to do that with Secretary Prudhom. So I'm optimistic about where we're gonna go from there and I'll continue uh, to work relentlessly with you, sir, 
and with you, sir, and Secretary Mayhew, and you, Mary, to make that happen. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Governor, can I say one other thing? Of course. I, I, I love all these ideas. I mean, the, the virtual hug and all, all of this. I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be here. But I just want to make something very clear. I'm looking for a real hug. <laughs> I'm not looking for a virtual hug. And, I, and I've been lucky enough to get that from my husband. Um, the absolute best hug of my life. I had a friend just paint the picture for me that I will keep forever. And I love all of these ideas, but our goal is to get to our loved ones. They need a hug from us, not a picture of me on FaceTime, not me at the window. They need us. And so I, I like the small steps, and I don't mean to disrespect them in any way, but I don't want anybody to be misunderstood about why I'm here. My goal is to safely and as quickly as possible, with the right guidelines, get us back to our families. Mm -hmm. So, how, um, just I know you're, you speak with all, a lot of families. What, what is the? Um, what are some of the ideas about what you know we can do to kind of move along? Are, are people uh, of the mind that you know just need to open it up, or do they think that that these uh, restrictions serve a purpose and that we need to continue to be careful? How would you uh, prize kind of the mindset of a lot of the folks you're talking with? Everybody believes that absolutely they were done for all the right reasons. Everybody understands why we are where we are today. But they also are seeing the complete decline of their loved ones in their personal care, in the way that they're being bathed and, or not being bathed, and, and having their hair cut and their fingernails clipped. And so they are feeling a sense of urgency. They want to do it safely. They want to be like the, like the staff. They will be tested. They will wear PPE. Right now, they'll, they'll be distanced. We can be outside. I mean, it really is amazing at their willingness to do whatever it takes, but to get me in front of my loved ones so that it's not through this stupid window that he doesn't understand and he tries to hand me things through there and he's crying at me. I mean, I stopped doing window visits because it was just so painful for him. And so we'll do anything. We'll be tested every time we go. We'll wear whatever you want us to wear. I mean, there's just such desperation and, and helplessness that we'll follow whatever rules. I mean, we will be the most stringent rule followers that you have ever seen because we understand what the risk is. I mean, God forbid I bring it into my husband's facility. Um, I would never, ever do anything. We will self-isolate. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing people say we are desperate to get to them, and we will follow every rule we have to follow. Have there been um, things done in other states that, that have been successful that you've seen? One of my favorites is an essential caregiver designation. It's being done in Indiana and Minnesota. Um, if you were an essential caregiver before, you had to have a record of it. And in, in these two states, it says at least two visits per week prior to the lockdown so that you indeed were an essential caregiver. One person can go in twice a week out on an appointment time. You have to be tested. You have to follow the guidelines that the staff takes. Um, and you have an hour with that person to spend time with them. You're not around any other uh, resident. It's one-on-one -on -one time. It's working very well in these two states. Um, in 14 other states, they do, they're doing outdoor visits so that you are taking the patient outside, the resident outside, so that you're not worrying about infecting the building. It's just us out there in PPE. Um, some people are letting people get close and actually touch with PPE. Others are requiring it to have a six-foot distance. That's a little bit harder, but you know what? We'll take that too. So if I can just get with him and be in the same room with him, then that's a whole lot better than being separated by the window that they absolutely can't understand. My husband doesn't understand why I'm at the window. He doesn't understand why I'm on this camera. I mean, I blow him a kiss on the camera on the FaceTime, and he leans down and he will kiss the, the iPad because he doesn't understand how it works. He also doesn't know that I'm a dishwasher. He just doesn't have the mental capacity to know why I'm there. He just knows that I'm there. And that hug, the first day when I walked in and he turned around and saw me and he said, Mary, I knew that he still remembered me and he put his arms out for us to hug, that natural instinct for us to hug. You can't get that through a window. And so that's what we're looking for. You know, with this essential caregiver, we may be able to just add them into our current testing um, uh, uh, apparatus because it basically, I mean, you would, right. all the tests go to the facilities, it's self-swab, you send it in, so you basically just have to go by the facility, pick it up, swab, send it in every two weeks. Well, and as, as Mary pointed out earlier, we, we have provided 
that pathway for individuals who, you know, prior to the restriction were in the right. facility providing, but I think the parameters now uh, where we could just have that level of protection make allow them in but just make sure that uh, the right PPE the testing etc which we may also want to just talk a little bit about we've got to be careful about some of the expectations around these point of care uh, testing devices they're not as um, we don't have enough of them yet uh, in all yeah, our and facilities. I think realistically I mean the federal government is sending I don't know the exact number but they're sending a 15-minute test uh, to thousands of nursing homes throughout the country. Well, you know, we have 4,000 different facilities. Now, they're not all uh, skilled nursing facilities, but long-term care. Right. So I don't know how they're going to pick that. I don't know who they're going to give it to in Florida. Uh, you know, those, those facilities have it. They could do the 15-minute, and then people could end up going in. Um, if you have, um, you know, other areas that don't have that, like there's a lot of testing capacity there's not great testing turnaround with some of these private labs that have really gotten backed up. When we were uh, going into May, we were like, all right, we want to do 35,000 tests a day in Florida. Well, we've had, uh, we had one day we had 144,000 results returned. We've had 100,000 uh, pretty, pretty consistently. So it, it's, that's happening all over the country where more and more tests, a lot of asymptomatic people are testing. The problem with that is, is it just means that a turnaround time of 48 hours is now turning into five or six days. Uh, so to do a lab-based test for like a family member, it, you just, you're not going to get the results back soon enough for it to really matter. So the point of care gives a good window, but there's not going to be a point of care at every, I mean, you know, we have this mobile bus, RV, 45-minute test. And I thought about maybe just going and, and doing that for family members. You know, then come get swabbed, go get breakfast or lunch, then come back if they're. But then I'm like, okay, well, how do I choose which facility to do? Because obviously we can't do 4,000 facilities. I mean, we would be able to do one or two a day. Um, and so I think it's just a question of, you know, how many of these uh, these point of care are going to be there. Most of the companies, their first customer that they serve are the hospitals, which obviously you understand that. So they're doing that. Hospitals want more test strips and everything. Now we have the federal government doing stuff for the nursing homes, but it's not going to be enough for, for every, every facility you know, throughout, the, throughout the, uh, the state of Florida. Uh, so some may have the ability to do that. Others won't, and so that's why we've got to figure out you know, what can we do with some of those other ones. And then also just in the meantime, these point-of-care tests aren't all on the ground. Um, they're supposed to be coming this month, but in the meantime, those facilities as well will still, uh, will, will, will still be in the same, same predicament. But I do think if you, if you do expand this caregiver, uh, they can be, potentially be included in what we're already doing with some of the staff. And you know, the staff is, is about 200,000 tests every two weeks, but once the test, once the staff tests positive, they probably don't need to be screened anymore going forward. I mean, they can isolate, symptoms based, return, but they're not going to get reinfected. Uh, you know, we, we have a pretty high high belief in that. Uh, so maybe some of those tests would be available as well. So I think that there's ways uh, that we can work on the testing, but it would probably, I don't know that it would be point of care, it would just be the periodic testing that we're doing for the staff, maybe include some family members um, into that. I, I know in, in my, my husband's facility, which is um, Rose Castle at Deerwood, they are already looking into buying their own point of care yeah. machine. And, and we are willing, I mean, I hear from everybody, I'll pay for the test. I mean, the test that I take at my brother-in-law's practice, I take a test on Thursdays before I go see him, it costs $25. And I can, for the, for the cost of the test, I will gladly, as will every other family member, I can promise you, gladly pay for their own test, pay for the machinery, whatever. Obviously, and now I'm you know, learning this process to get a, a CLIA waiver so that the location can actually be doing, providing that test. But those are steps going forward that we don't need to rely on the governor or the government to provide those for us if we as a community can furnish that for ourselves. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the question is just going to be is, is, is how soon, like, let's just assume all 4,000 of our facilities said, you know what, we'll buy it, 
and you know maybe we don't have a lot of money, but we'll just charge, and all the re all the families will pay. The the problem is 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 how many of those machines are going to be available, particularly in relatively short time frame. I mean, I think that you know we're looking at. I I have no doubt that by March you will probably have these things. You can get them a dime a dozen. I bet. But you know we need them sooner. I mean, like now is now is the time we need them. So so I think that's going to be the question: is just how soon are they able to get this? When we did, when the Abbott test came out, and then the Cephi at 45 minute test, we we directed some of that to some of our hospitals. But you know they they were all running short. They'd only get a certain number of test strips every week. They burned through those very quickly. And it's like, okay, can you produce more? I've talked to the CEO of Abbott. I've talked to the CEO of Cephi over the months. And, and they're, they're burning through as much as they can. They're producing as much as they can. But there is, there is just uh, there's a lot of demand, and, and, and they're not in a position to be able to meet everywhere. Even we in Florida, you know, we wanted to buy high-throughput lab tests where I could just run 10,000 through each site. We have a, a lab in Jacksonville. We just do 10,000. Um, and we probably can get that machine, but probably not for another four or five months. I mean, we were ready to pay for it. We were, we were happy to do it. But this is what is, is going on all throughout the country. So, uh, but I just think we just need to be creative. I mean, the testing is obviously important, uh, but I do think that with PPE and some of these other things, I think if families have antibodies, if they, if they have antibodies, man, we should we obviously need to be, be recognizing that and how powerful that can be. So there's the, there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of opportunities, but I don't think like as you guys go and deliberate, I would just say do not only fixate on testing. Right. Um, yeah, you've got to think of other ways. Look, I'm comfortable with the PPE. Hell, hug them. I mean, come on. Like, it's not not gonna. You're, if you if you have PPE on and you hug and you don't sneeze or do something on them, you're gonna be fine. Okay, it's very that'd be very low. Now, obviously, if you're if you're there for for 30 minutes doing that and then you do well, then that's gonna be a different situation. But to just have to just go give give a hug, I mean, I think that uh, I think that you could do that, and I think that that, that that would be that would be very meaningful. I mean, as much as you want to see him in person, I kind of feel like you know, stay six feet away. It's kind of still you know providing the reminder that it's still not normal and you know you're still not there for that so i do think the the the, the touch is important I, I would say it's, it's hugely important another thing we don't want to lose sight of too is you know mental health and wellness is a is a passion of mine is to consider your mental health and wellness right. through all of this because Absolutely. as we are thinking of your husband and you are on the front lines trying to care for him day in and day out don't think that that doesn't have a toll on you and so I've talked to a lot of psychologists, and, and they have talked about, a, unfortunately, a tsunami. As, as this starts to um, really set in in people's minds, that people are going to need to seek care that right. they have not had the opportunity or have ever thought about doing in the past. So one of the things that we are working on and we have not lost sight of is how do someone, perhaps like you, who have never um, sought care, uh, who just needs to be able to talk to somebody, to get it off of their chest, to re-energize their batteries, to get back in there and do everything they can to, to help their loved ones, making sure that you know where to find it. Um, because there are avenues out there for help, but if they're out there and nobody knows that they right. exist, then what good are they? So that's another thing that we're working on. You know, I think, Mary, you may have even said um, it's, a, it's an unfathomable grief. They're still here, but you're completely cut off. And, you know, we know that people have lost loved ones that they haven't been able to, to see. It's painful enough when someone you love needs to be cared for uh, and you don't have the ability to do it, but then to not be able to, to see them, to hug them, to hold them. We all need our family. Uh, so, I, you know, I am confident, Governor, that with the right approach to PPE, right? We know healthcare workers every day are caring for COVID patients and they don't get COVID, right? Adherence strictly to PPE, supporting some appropriate training uh, of visitors so that there's no breach, that, that they can have that kind of contact with their loved ones. I'm very confident that we can uh, move forward and, and do it in a way that everyone has confidence and we can do it safely. Are there um, families that, that you know of who don't want visitation or just think it's too risky? No one. They all want to find a way? Yes, sir. Okay. And I think that stress extends to the staff, too. They're stressed out because their, their residents are stressed out. They're stressed out because the families are calling with stress and anxiety. So 
the burden is very circular. And they're used to the families too. Like right. I was saying, the woman that feed their mother, you know, their mother. And for me, I, you know, after dinner, Steve is all mine. I mean, right. I take care of him. I get him ready for bed. He, right. I walk out and I say he's good. He's asleep, and they don't have to worry about him. And all of a sudden, that help is gone. Right. And right. they're overworked. They're fatigued. I mean, they're tired. That weight, the mental part of this on them too, is extremely hard. They're now giving the haircuts. They're now having to do all these things that they didn't want to do, have never done before. And that's an important part too. Right. She got it. There you go. You got it? Okay. No, I, truly, um, I, I, I don't think that that's understood, um, the degree to which that is such a huge contribution to the care that's being provided for family members right. that are able to support uh, and how much direct care staff um, not only depend on but value um, family members being in and supporting um, other residents in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the staff, it's been uh, uh, very stressful. We had uh, uh, a nursing home in North Florida in the last month that had 50 staff members test positive. Um, you know, so they were gone. We had to send in people, uh, nurses, some contract nurses to go in there, you know, to care for the residents. But that's a huge, huge thing um, because they're already shorthanded. Um, then you have this. So, yeah, I think the families, uh, you know, play a really, really important role just from uh, just from that aspect. I think it's safe to say we'll be back. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think. Uh, I think you guys have uh, have get together if you need any more people to uh, to put on and just uh, uh, develop some ideas. But I think I think I'm comfortable with doing the antibody moving forward with that. So maybe we'll figure out you know some type of rule or something of how they would do. We do offer antibody testing, by the way, uh, at all of our drive-through test sites throughout the state of Florida. We've been doing it in Jacksonville for for many months. That's open to the general public. And uh, what I've tried to tell people is, look, if, you, if you're not symptomatic and you just kind of like, hey, I, maybe I want to see if I have it, um, you're probably better off doing the antibody because that'll tell you if you've ever had it. You know, the symptom, if you're asymptomatic, you know, it, it, the, the test can't necessarily tell you whether you have a live infection. It can tell you whether there's virus detected, but I think as CDC has pointed out, it can detect dead virus. Uh, that's not live for, for many, many weeks after that. Uh, so take advantage of the antibody testing. I think it's good. I think if you have the antibodies, you know, you do know that that confers a certain level of protection and uh, that's a great thing to know. All right, with that, anybody have questions? Governor, right here. Uh, Sky LeBron with WJCT News. I know biweekly testing was something that you brought up uh, a couple times right here um, and it's something that was mandated in mid-June. That was just before we started to see a huge rise in the number of cases. It was just a few days after that was mandated. So I wanted to ask is, is biweekly testing for these employees of these ALS, is that enough? Is that still considered six weeks after we start to see that rise in cases? Well, I think the, at the end of the day, when you have over 200,000 people, uh, just the logistics involved with testing that many people of across 4,000 facilities is very difficult. And so, um, uh, I think that it's a good screening device. I think it has been effective. We've been able to identify staff, isolate staff, and prevent it from spreading for the residents. And so, uh, yes, when, whenever you have a rise in prevalence, uh, that is going to be reflected in every aspect of society. I will say, though, that if you look at the results we've had, and we're probably getting close to 400,000 results, uh, the percent that test positive has been a fraction of the percent that is test positive uh, uh, throughout the throughout the state. I mean, we were testing at 15 percent. Uh, you know, now we've been down nine, 10 percent lately. I think it's going to continue to go down, but but we've been at like three and four percent with the staff. So I think that probably is a reflection of I think they are a little bit more cautious with terms of their interactions because I think they understand they're dealing with a lot of very vulnerable uh, folks that if they go and they get in, you know, we talk about all the things we talk about. Obviously, protect the vulnerable is the number one thing that we've stressed throughout this whole time. Uh, not that you don't want to watch, you know, how you interact with someone of your 20 and, and another 20-year-old, but, um, but that's really, you know, the issue. So I think if they're somebody who's around the vulnerable, then they look at these hygiene, distancing, avoiding some of the uh, closed spaces, crowded places, mask when you're in public, things like that. I think they're probably more uh, likely to be really following this, and I think that that's a reflection. So I think the two weeks um, uh, has helped us. 
Um, I'm not sure that that we would do doing it every week would be uh, would be something that would that would necessarily add a lot. I mean, I, I, I it's a tough thing logistically. I think we've got a good, good. So I mean, we get the results back once it hits the lab. We got a lab turning around in 24 hours. Uh, that's a huge, huge deal. That allows them to be able to immediately notify the facility and do the pro appropriate isolation. I don't think any other state in the country is doing as many people as we're doing um, on this on this type of scale. You know, some I remember they were saying I was at the White House one day and someone was like, "Hey, just go test all your nursing homes. Get that done in a week." And I'm thinking to myself, "Wait a minute! <laughs> in Florida, that'd be about 350 to 400,000 people." It's not as easy to spread out all over the state. It's, it's not that easy. So we found, I think, a way to do it in a way that's efficient and effective. Um, and we're going to keep doing it. It's, it's expensive. Uh, it's probably one of the most expensive things that we've done. Uh, but our view is, is that we have to protect the vulnerable. And, and throughout this whole thing, we've done everything we could to make a difference. Uh, not everything is foolproof, unfortunately. I mean, to see some of the staff at the, like this facility in North Florida test, I mean, they're going through screening and all this. A lot of them, they weren't even symptomatic. Um, and so even with all these measures in place, you still have incidents that happen. Uh, but uh, we, we've done time and time again. But we also, and one of the reasons we're here, we understand that you could have the best of intentions. You could be doing the best you can to protect people from the virus. Actions are not cost-free. It impacts other people, and we have to figure out a way to do both, uh, to protect the vulnerable, but also alleviate the stress, anxiety, and emotional uh, trauma that so many families have felt. Governor, yes, sir. David Jones with First Coast News. Good to see you. Uh, quick two-part question. The first, I wonder if I could get your reaction to what you thought when you first saw Ms. Daniels' story. Uh, and then the second part, you said you would be supportive of someone with the antibodies possibly being able to go visit a nursing home. Uh, any kind of rough estimate or timetable for when you see the state allow that? So the second question is, I think Mary and I are going to work on this today, and we got to, you know, it's not going to happen like in six hours, but I think we're going to do it. I guess we just have to figure out, you know, how you produce the results or whatever. But I'm comfortable doing it, and, and we'll check with the Department of Health, but I think they would be they would be comfortable with it as well. So in terms of Mary's side, I could tell you that, um, you know, I've always been very mindful of any of the stuff that we're doing, how that impacts people who we're not thinking about in terms of the virus. You know, everything from the beginning of this, when we started to do different stuff with, 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 with uh, businesses and all this other stuff, long-term care obviously was something very impactful. And so we, we tend to kind of see, okay, you know, what are the cases? You know, what are this, what are that? It's very important, and the virus is a nasty thing. And we've, we've obviously mobilized a lot throughout the world and the country and the state uh, to do it. Um, but one of the things that's weighed on me is you're taking these actions. What does that mean? What does that mean for somebody who has no coronavirus in a facility, but you're in a long-term care and you have someone that passes away? Say that happened in the beginning of June. They would not have had any family interaction for the last two and a half months of their life. That has a cost. That is something that those families will always carry with them. And so I think Mary um, and, and others that we've seen, but I think she's been just fantastic in terms of really speaking to this issue, um, you know, she personalizes uh, what uh, I knew from the very beginning was just an unavoidable consequence of some of the measures uh, that we're taking. And so I think about her. And, and in that connection, but I also think about the families that just um, aren't going to ever have a chance to say goodbye. Well, the good governor, Scott Johnson, News for Jacks. Two questions that's kind of tangentially related to this on education. There's a lot of kids going back to school. There's concern they bring home to the elderly population. Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics saying unless it's below 5% positivity rate, we shouldn't restart schools. Do you agree with that? Also, we're hearing reports of a major announcement coming from the Department of Education today. Can you speak on that? So on the positivity, here's I was religiously hyping positivity in March, April, May, because I was like, you know what? It, this is an asymptomatic illness largely for most people. If I test 10,000 in Duval, uh, I'll find, and it's 5%. If I test 20, 
I'll, st I'll find twice as much if it's five. So as long as the percent is, is thing, the problem is, is the way these tests are reported, some labs don't report the negatives religiously. Sometimes they do data dumps. I'd be very cautious of tying a child's future to the efficacy of some private lab dumping the results into a system. And this is, that's a change for me, because I will, you go back, I can probably find you examples of me in, in May talking about positivity is, is really important. I'm not saying it's not something you would never consider ever, but just, I think we've understood some of the limitations. If you look at this, the best indicator of prevalence in the community has been emergency department visits with COVID-like illness. If you want to look at Florida, how we've seen this Sunbelt surge, um, yeah, I think Arizona started before us, we kind of followed. You saw, I mean, in May, we had less than 500 a day. For a state this big, ED visits just, just flat, 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 beginning of June. Then as we got into that, that mid part of June, you started to see the ED visits going up. The testing wasn't even capturing that at that time because the testing was, was bad, was, you know, these are seven day turnarounds sometimes by the time they put in the system. So then you started going, and then that peaked the beginning, uh, probably the end of the first week of July, kind of that second week of July. And then sure enough, you know, you can look forward. The hospitalizations peaked shortly after that. Um, and, and I think that's been the best indicator. So I would say look at those ED visits, but I would also say, that we also have to look to see whether schools, particularly primary schools, have been engines of transmission for coronavirus. It wasn't uh, in Sweden, which kept it open the whole time. They didn't have a lockdown. Sweden and Norway put out a joint statement recently saying, Norway, we shut down schools. Sweden didn't. Guess what? Sweden was right. It did not, it did not increase the spread in the community. And I think there's also been studies that show people in the school system you know, don't have any more of a chance uh, of, of being infected um, than, than, than others in the community. Now, in terms of elderly, you all, any multi-generational household, regardless of the school situation, that's something you've got to consider. But I think the evidence of particularly younger kids transmitting to adults is not great. I mean, it's typically the adults that are affecting the younger kids. But I would say that the, we've always said if, if you have a family, if a, first of all, if a child has any type of health issues, you have a, you have a right to opt for distance learning even if you, for any reason. We're not going to second guess a parent. If you're not comfortable doing it, sometimes kids uh, may have some health issues that parents are concerned about, understandable. Sometimes you have these family situations where they may want to opt for distance, totally understandable. Sometimes the parent just may not be comfortable for whatever reason, totally understandable. It's a, it's a, a, a difficult time, we understand that, and we want to empower the parent. But my response would just be, uh, uh, I would rather have that opt-out available than to deny all the kids the ability uh, to get that for in, in class instruction. And here's the thing, um, you know, we obviously see how this thing has evolved in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Um, you know, I think the trend is positive. I think by the time we get um, you know, a couple weeks into the future, I think we're going to continue to see um, the prevalence uh, decline, and that'll be a very, very good thing. Um, in terms of education, um, uh, I don't have uh, visibility on this specific announcement. And last question. Hey, Governor, I'm Chris Phil of Action News, Jack. I know a lot of family members and loved ones are watching closely right now. Just kind of any reassurance you can give them on how quickly this committee will be moving along and any kind of timetable, like, you know, days, weeks, or... Well, month. they're going to be moving uh, immediately. Uh, now, obviously, it's going to take a little time to, to, to tee up some, uh, uh, s some ac uh, action items, but I think we do have an action item teed up with the antibodies. Uh, I'm going to follow up with the White House about the status of the point of care test to see, and again, that's only going to be a, a certain number of the facilities, but we'll take a look at that. We're also going to look at maybe expanding the caregiver designation uh, and how that would work. And then I think you guys will have other ideas. So my, my directive to them is, is get to it. Um, you know, we want you to do it as, as, as soon as possible. Obviously, we want to be safe. We want to make sure that these folks are, uh, are protected, but, um, you know, even with, when you talk about PPE, if, look, if you need PPE from us, uh, we've given a lot to the facilities, but you know, maybe some of the families need some access to some PPE. Those are things. So I'm, I want any suggestion we can. So hopefully as, as soon as possible. Now, I think the ultimate vision may take a little bit of time. I don't want to give anyone false hope to say, you know what, 
next week, everyone go, because there's going to have to be precautions that are, that are maintained. But you know, what I, my view on all this stuff with, with any of these measures is, okay, you know, we know that this is something, that, that the virus is here. I don't, I don't think anyone honestly thought it was just going to go away. Uh, it's something we've had to live with. Uh, but let's find a way to do some of the things that, that we want people to do. And so, yes, this is a very vulnerable environment. Obviously, you're going to take more precautions on that than you would on some of the other things that, 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 that people do um, in their daily lives. But I think it's worth putting forth the effort, being thoughtful about it, being innovative. And you know what? Um, you know, if we're able to get to a point where we're facilitating some of these uh, some of these human interactions, particularly for people who may not have the opportunity to do that ever again, uh, then all the effort will have been worth it. So thank you. Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. I will. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk to everybody. Yes, sir.